Let me start this off by saying one thing. I absolutely despise blood trees. Look, there are a hundred thousand ways to go out in this world, and over half of those are from cryptids. Half of that is pretty quick or relatively painless, and smaller still are the ones that make it hurt. Within this percentage are two ways of death that every one of you really needs to be aware of. One, a mental break. This one isn't exclusive to eldritch beings, but they love the crap. The idea of yanking your mind and soul out of your body and driving you mad while inflicting pain is probably their favorite dish. You sit there for what feels like an eternity, getting your soul flayed while they show you images and scenes that no human were built to see. And two, a physical break. These are what I like to call digesters, an entity, human or not, who secures your body to something and just puts you through it. Taking your skin off, bamboo under the fingernails, taking out your eyelids, you know the works. These things typically have the ability to heal the damage they cause so they can inflict more pain without ending you. Blood trees. Well, they can do both. I don't know what person conjured these things up, but I hope their creation did some turnabout on them. Blood trees are hard to pin down. Not that there aren't a lot of them. They are everywhere, relatively speaking. Every forest in the US and Canada has them. The young ones are more active, constantly needing food. And every once in a while you get some kind of cult that pops up around them with guys wearing robes, chanting in a made-up language, while they eat some poor schmuck into the bowels of the tree. They typically feast on a living body for a few weeks, and then longer as they get older and learn how to make the meal last longer. The older ones are the ones that you really have to worry about. One live body can sustain them for a few decades or so, which means you are typically being digested for the rest of your natural life. If they get more bodies, they store them for later. The ugly tree from the Johnny Depp version of a Sleepy Hollow, a blood tree. Some can serve as gateways to a pain dimension or something, but those are actually really rare. So, blood trees possess the ability to not only digest you over time and keep you alive while doing so, but many of them can mess with your mind while doing it. So, you can see why I hate them. The following investigation showcases three things. One, I freaking hate blood trees. Two, I hate other agencies. Talking about you FBI, suck it. And three, I try not to go on any investigation alone. Being alone means you're more vulnerable and there's no help. So, on to the investigation. Agent Echo, arrival and scene at 645. December Redacted, Colorado. You'll realize pretty quick that I hit a lot of things. Dense forests, cults, springform pans, the FBI. Three of these things came into play today. I found myself at the entrance to a state park, whose name I won't share for obvious reasons. For this one, I didn't have to blend in with the local so no crappy apartment or beat to grab vehicle to deal with. Nope. I made my way to Fort Carson and yanked one of their range control trucks, something with some ground clearance and self-recovery options. I pulled the big vehicle into the gravel parking lot which was freshly layered with fresh snow. I can't tell you enough how freaking beautiful this state is. Flat trees, a quiet wilderness, elk running everywhere and in many cases, not a lot of people. Anyways. The small visitor center sat nestled in the foreground of a mountain range, an idyllic location for a lovely state park. It was a log cabin style, a single story with large windows, dark stain and a green tin roof. A set of glass double doors served as the entrance with, a small set of stairs leading up to it and a handicap ramp to the side. There were a few park ranger trucks sitting off to the side and the rest of the lot was empty save for a couple of mid-sized SUVs and a Subaru or two. 
After parking and shutting off the truck, I hopped out and checked for my gear. I was wearing a set of snow pants over my jeans and a matching parka with fur lining. Mittens covered my thin undergloves and I wore a black beanie. It was balls cold out, and I really don't like being cold. But I dressed down enough so I wouldn't get overheated while walking. My backpack held enough food and supplies for a few days of travel, with a small axe hanging off the side. I slung a 12 gauge over my shoulder and slid a 454 revolver with a 6 inch barrel into the holster at my hip. Why such a big revolver, you might ask? Oh, a few reasons. First off, this is bear country. I don't give a crap about hibernation season. You don't go into bear country at any time without packing some iron. And second off, revolvers don't jam like a semi-auto will. And third, a 454 will put down a bear without much drama. Go into a fight with a bear using a 9mm, I dare you. And bear attacks happen pretty quick. So you aren't going to be playing John Wick with a 500 pound bear that can move quicker than you. Secure that I had all of my crap, I walked up these snowy steps and into the visitor center. It was quiet, not unsettlingly quiet, but just so that no one was really having loud conversations. A tall, brawny man with sandy-colored hair made his way up to me, a park ranger by the uniform. He opened his mouth to speak when I shoved a piece of paper in his face. He took a few moments to read it and then folded it and handed it back to me. Well, that takes care of the first round of questions. I'm Ranger Sandover, but you can call me Mike. Echo, nice to meet you. Echo. The beginning of amusement lit up on his face. Is that a secret code name? I wasn't about to explain the intricacies of agency policy or the need for official cover names to a park ranger. Yes, Mike, it's a code name. Now screw off. Instead, I looked up at him. He was probably a hair taller than Shout was, but more muscular. Yep. Can we get to business, Mike? He chuckled. Sure thing. He turned and waved me along as he walked through the facility. You with the FBI or something? I bristled. You may not know this, but I hate the FBI. No, they do their own thing and I don't mess with them. I barely hid my disgust. The walk through the facility was short. It took only a few seconds to reach the wooden door labeled Ranger Office and for Mike to throw it open and reveal the contents inside. It wasn't anything special. A medium-sized wooden desk, just a basic industry catalog issue, sat in the middle. A computer screen from 20 years ago sat on the side, along with the nameplate of the supervisor to the area. James T. Celery. Ranger Celery sat his portly butt in a swivel chair behind his desk. He was huge. Not huge like a UFC heavyweight. Huge as he probably could wolf down an elk by himself huge. His fat face had sweat on it just from sitting, and his hair had cleared out of the top of his head, leaving a horseshoe of thin brown hair that traveled the circumference of his dome. To his side stood another ranger. That made up the three on duty right now. Christ, she was adorable. Black hair, bright blue eyes. A hair taller than me and probably in better shape than Mike. That was about all that she had going for her. Name tag said in Bristol. Who is this, a new guy? Why are you bringing an armed civilian in here? Not a civilian. You remember the other day. We got a call about an agent coming to take a look around. Well, this is Agent Echo. Bristol looked at me like she didn't want any part of me. And probably the same way I look at FBI agents. And why do we need an agent? This is a state park we don't need. This lady was already getting on my nerves, so I cut her off. Are you the one in charge? If not, then shut the heck up. This crap is above your pay grade. I could hear shout now. Do you always start fights wherever you go? Sometimes, but I can't help it though. This long, doing the work I do. I don't have the time or patience for uppity peons. 
Bristol turned fully towards me and started forward. Immediately, I pulled the revolver free and thumbed the hammer down, pointing it at her body. Don't even try it. I could put a new butthole in every inch of your body and still get away with it. The room was tense. Mike's face was white. Obviously, the guy was an easygoing type. One who hadn't seen the more uncaused side of human nature. Celery, to his credit, remained calm, folding his hands together. All right, now calm down, everyone. Bristol will take a walk outside. Agent, please lower your weapon. I understand your role here, but let's have a bit of tact. I nodded slowly and stepped to the side when Bristol passed, still glaring daggers at me, and closed the door. I ran the hammer forward and slid the revolver back into the holster. Please sit down. I didn't. The search and rescue team is arriving soon. You can head out with them when the snow lives. He wiped the sweat from his brow with a handkerchief. I shook my head. I'm not search and rescue. There's something else that I'm after and honestly, this is a courtesy that we told you I'm coming. Sometimes they didn't understand that. For a few reasons, my objective isn't exactly the safety of human beings. Search and rescue handles that. My objective is the destruction of the cryptid emergence that I was assigned to. That and feelings can get you killed and it sucks. That's the way that it is. I just need someone who knows the area. Well, Mike is new. Crap. The search and rescue won't be here until a few hours most likely. Double crap. Uh, meaning the only experienced one I can stand with you is Bristol. Triple crap. I sighed. Search and rescue may not be willing to hightail it right now. I'm not sure why search and rescue would be delaying at the moment. But I didn't have the luxury of waiting. Fine, I said. After exhaling a calming breath. As a group, we walked out of the office. Celery pulled Bristol to the side while Mike and I hung back. And be careful. I shouldn't be saying this, but Bristol is a temper. He said in a whisper. Then don't. Thanks for the concern, but I'll be fine. I replied evenly. Celery and Bristol talked for a few minutes. A few minutes that went by way too slow. Once they were done... Bristol disappeared in the back for a few moments, and then returned dressed for the weather, a lever-action rifle slung over her shoulder. I nodded, when then she returned, and we walked out of the station and around to the back towards the looming line of flat trees that marked the true boundary to the park. We followed the snow-filled footsteps into the trees and started along a path that would have been easier to see were it not for the eight inches of snow covering the ground. Echo, did you make that up? Must be some kind of organization for you to just use code names. Are you the CIA? At least she didn't say FBI. No, CIA handles issues outside of the continental US mostly. Espionage and things like that. I replied evenly. Our earlier tension suppressed under a layer of professionalism. We walked for a while. The miles passed and the time went with it. It was midday by the time either of us attempted conversation again. Huh, so what are we looking for? You said that you weren't a search and rescue, so what's the deal? She spoke after a few minutes. We were walking side by side in the pathway, and I pulled up a GPS with a preloaded set of coordinates on it. Honestly, I won't be sure until I see it. Two thumbs. And hopefully it's nothing. Three more thumbs. I paused while Bristol walked forward. Alarm bells going off in my head. Something was coming. I sped up my walk and I closed in on the ranger, mouth opening to speak. You act like it's just gonna jump out at you. Jesus, she had to say that. From the thick underbrush, a bear barreled out, large, fast, and angry. It shouldered me to the side, having locked in Bristol as its target. My shotgun fell to the side and I went backwards onto my back. 
Bristol screamed out as the bear slammed her to the ground. Massive paws raising and slamming down were to try and rip her limb from limb. If she hadn't gotten her rifle long ways between herself and the bear, she really would have been done for. As I came to my feet, the bear caught her left shoulder and smiled, grabbing and dragging her to the side, shaking her violently. I ran up with the 454 in hand. I got up close so I wouldn't risk hitting her and fired. Once, twice, the bear went down in a heap, its head half gone. I took Bristol's rifle and looped the sling around the bear's neck and pulled back hard, giving the ranger a bit of room to shimmy out from under it. Blood was pulled underneath her shoulder, and she was breathing hard, eyes wet at the realization of what had just happened set in. I dropped to her side and pulled her coat open, expecting to find a tattered mass of flesh where her torso had been. Instead, I found claws. Not marks, but actual claws. The claws from the bear's paws had broken off the second they split the skin. Uh, alright, you look surprisingly good. Bewildered was a good word for it. Her nervous chuckle split the air. A few drops of blood pooled from under her uniform shirt, but her shoulder was a little worse off. The teeth had remained intact for a bit longer, and did cut a few nice gouges into the flash. I pulled a med kit out of her bag and set to work. How, how am I not, what the heck? She spoke between breaths. She looked up at my face and shot me a peculiar stare. You know what happened, freaking tell me. That thing should have ripped my guts out. What's going on? I finished the bandage on her shoulder inside. Reaching out, I pulled the claws from her chest and lifted one up, squeezing it between my fingers. It snapped quickly and fell to pieces afterwards. It was already dead. Come again? She spoke incredulously. Already dead. I think I know why, but I really wish I didn't. I leaned down and removed Bristol's knife from the sheath on her belt. Before she could protest, I lifted up the arm of the bear to expose its underbelly better, and I pushed the knife in. Pulling to the side, the skin split open with a sick pop and its insides fell out all over the snow. Huge clots of red remained attached to the different organs, and I reached a gloved hand down into its body, searching around for a moment. Okay, that's disgusting. What in God's name are you doing? I didn't speak for a moment, and then I pulled my hand free, holding up a horrid-looking object. It looked like a seed with many small roots coming out of it. It was like a tumor growing, the roots wriggling randomly, trying to find purchase into something. Oh my God. Bristol went pale. Most people did when they first saw one of these things. Human minds can't fully process some things very well. A blood tree, god dang it. I stuck the tip of the knife into the seed and pulled it free. A copious amount of fresh red spewed from the opening. More than the palm-sized thing could have been able to hold. I tossed it back into the bear. It's been using the bear to travel. Animals have an instinct that is hard to override, especially with a predatory animal. A few more days in the sea, it could have controlled it. Okay, I'm gonna need you to explain this in a bit more detail. Why isn't the bear hibernating? Why didn't it kill me? How is it dead and what the heck was the thing you just pulled out of it? I sighed softly. Look at the bear's head where I shot it. Look where I cut it. See any blood that didn't come from the seed? No, because it's already coagulated. The bear was mostly done for. It attacked you because the seed trying to control it made it lose its mind. The seed that I pulled out is from a blood tree. They survive off of fresh bodies. There is a whole book I could tell you, but just realize that they are bad news, and it seems you have one in your little park. Probably with a cult around it too. A cult? Like guys in black robes chanting stuff. Yep, exactly. Blood trees don't usually infect animals. 
their instincts make it hard to separate an animal from its natural area to spread, which means it was probably put there by someone. Ergo, you have a blood tree cult. Here, help me with this. Finding it next to a bottle of tequila and a rag, I pulled a big bottle of lighter fluid from my bag and tossed Bristol along towards. She fumbled with it, but caught it. I began dousing the bear with a lighter fluid. I'm not sure how many seeds are in this thing, so the best bet is to burn it. Once finished, I swapped the fluid for the torch and set the bear alight. Bristol squeezing a bit more fluid on there for good measure. So what now? She asked softly, nibbling her lap. Find the tree, burn it, and take out the cultists. She didn't respond. We took a few minutes to rest and eat, regain some energy. I checked her bandages, but the wounds were surprisingly superficial. Bristow floated the idea of making camp, but I shook my head. Not the place we want to camp. If we're going to find it and live, then we have to find it soon. It knows that its seeds just died. After securing all of our gear and finding a rifle and my shotgun, we continued our walk in the direction the bear had come from, with me reloading the 454 on the way. A half hour went by before we spoke again. Um, Echo. Far contrasting her earlier bravado at her first meeting, her voice was meek and girlish as scared. Yeah. What's going to happen to me? Dang, she had good instincts too. Well, it depends. If the seeds had enough control to sprout their own, then you'll probably be infected. Your shoulder will ache more, get red hot, and you'll see small roots in the wound. They'll slowly move through your body until they invade your brain and take you out while retaining control of your body. If not, then a few weeks of recovery and you'll be fine. I don't sugarcoat things. It never pays to, really. Bad things happen, and they happen whether we like it or not. She let out a small sob. It was still too early to tell if she had been infected, though. Well, what happens then? You burn me, too. Well, after I put a bullet in your head, yeah. Mostly so you won't feel it. But remember, it's too early to tell. You might be alright. That wasn't a lie, at least. We walked farther and deeper into the woods. The sun had set, leaving us in the darkness. But the moon provided enough light that it reflected off the snow and made walking easier. I didn't want to use a light. We already made enough noise, walking to risk fully giving ourselves away visually. We stalked silently up the ridge where light played random shadow games over the top and on the other side. I slid down to my knees in the snow and Bristol followed suit, where we crawled the rest of the way up. Looking out, there is a small clearing, a fire looming in front of a large and narrow tree that bled profusely from many different openings. Four figures in hooded cloaks stood there, evenly spaced but far from the tree to stay out of range of its flailing limbs and roots. The scene was grotesque, and I heard Bristol dry heave into a jacket to muffle the sound. I had been around a few of them, and I still have to fight nausea from overwhelming me. These things were bad news on every level, a sickening entity that could have an effect on someone just based on proximity. I watched for a few minutes just to get the nausea under control, and hopefully Bristol could do the same. I looked over to her, laying just a few feet from me. Hey, you alright? Yeah, I think. Well, make sure you are, and this is gonna happen fast. I peeked over the rise that we lay upon, noticing that we were about two meters above the clearing. Not much of an elevated position, but enough to give us an edge. I searched in my bag for the bottle of tequila. Shame to use it on a blood tree, but we would have to get another bottle later. I unscrewed the cap and stuffed a rag into it, and then put the cap back on. I hopped on the hill, killed the cultists, burned the tree. Wait, we can't just kill them. The law doesn't work like that, Echo. <laughs> Are you serious? Do you know what these people would do to you if they... My words were stopped short by the sound of heavy footsteps. 
I looked back in time to see an athletic man barreling towards us, blood in his eyes with a touch of fanaticism. I saw the faint traces of a ranger uniform before her, a long leg pushed forward and a vicious kick to my side. The amount of power in the kick was absolutely ridiculous. My body lifted off the snow-covered ground and with a scream of pain, I went over the side and down the two-meter drop onto the floor below. Trying to catch my breath, I pushed shakily to my knees. My shotgun landed to the side a few feet away. A quick lift of my head showed me that the three-robed figures were coming at an alarming pace. Pulling the revolver free, I lifted it in a quick motion and fired. One cultist dropped. My reaction was a little bit slow due to the fall though, and I managed to squeeze one more shot off that, took out the left thigh of a second, causing the woman's screams to echo out into the wilderness. The third one had reached me, dropping his full weight on top of me. He slapped the 454 out of my grasp and closed around my neck with two beefy hands squeezing tight and cutting off my air supply instantly. I thrashed, moving and squirming, trying to get away. Another shot rang out in the forest, followed by a thud off in the distance. I couldn't hear much, my ears were clogged, my vision was fading. He was far too strong at this point, and had too much leverage. I guess this was my time. A thunderclap startled both of us. The man stiffened and fell to the side like he had gotten hit by a sledgehammer, which he might as well have. Bristol pulled herself forward, ragged breath shooting steam into the cold night air. Her rifle fell down as she kneeled next to me and pulled me up to a sitting position. Leaning on each side, we climbed to our feet and grabbed the 454. She held the bottle of tequila up for me to see and didn't even need to say anything. I pulled out the torch and lit the rag, and Bristol reared back like she was throwing a grenade. Her aim was perfect. The Molotov sailed through the air and blew against the side of the tree. The fire spread all along the trunk. Screeches from the tree, a cacophony of all its still living victims, providing a macabre chorus for its death cry. The tree would burn for quite a while, most likely. Come on, let's get out of here. She didn't respond. Tucked under my shoulder, her breathing was a ragged rough, her body hot against mine. We tried to walk, but she held fast. Remember what you said earlier about the seeds? She spoke softly, almost calm, like she had accepted this. I laid her against the ridge and kneeled in front of her, reaching out to push her parka aside and lift her bandages. Small roots sprouted from the wound, which was festering and it was an angry rat. Crap. Yeah, this sucks. I stood there cursing internally. She had the instinct to be a part of her agency. That and she was a fighter, a survivor, a decent person actually. I pulled the revolver and aimed it at her. I really wish that I didn't have to do this. I know. She stared up at me, scared but knowing this was going to have to happen. You aren't going to look away. I never do. Just don't tell me when you're going to... I pulled the trigger. My face didn't change, but I just stood there breathing. Tears made their way down my cheeks, and I pulled a cigarette free and let it. After the tree had fully burned, I had to do the same to Bristol, as it was the only way to ensure the destruction of the seeds. I climbed the rise again to see Mike sand over his body, lifeless, with a giant hole in his head. I did the same to his body too, and that of the cultist as well, and then began the long trip back to the ranger station. I called Brain on the way back, and by the time I was done with the report, I had made it back. The parking lot was empty. Celery was gone. I put out a mark at him, there'll be more on that later and I jumped in the truck. Time to find a bar and get wasted at. End of transcription. There's another one. I'll let you guys know what happened to Celery next time, but until then, stay out of the freaking woods.